Hi folks and welcome back to another video. Today we will be taking a look at this Toshiba satellite laptop I got for free. The reason I got it for free is because it doesn't pass post and it was labeled as irreparable. But let's try to change that. So without any further ado, let's get started. Let's see what we have to work with. This computer also came separately with a 2.5 inch HDD in this bubble wrap and I'm 100% certain this is its own and it's not a brand new part. So first of all, I will check the HDD bay and just as suspected, it's empty. Let's take out its hardware from the bubble wrap and put it in its designated spot. First of all, let's take the battery out to not cause any more problems than we already have. But anyway, this battery is either just dead or it doesn't hold any charge because it didn't do anything without its charger. A very nice thing about this laptop, just like my other older Toshiba, is that everything has its own panel and you don't have to take everything apart to get to your RAM, to your HDD, to your wireless card, or to clean your heatsink. We'll just take these two screws here out and pop this panel off. Now, let's take the drive out of this bubble wrap. It could have been very good if it also were in an anti-static bag before putting it in here. But considering this laptop was deemed dead, I don't think they cared much. Conveniently, it still has its mounting bracket on. It would have been quite bad if this were lost because I don't have another one, none that I know of. We're just going to put this in here and then secure it with its own screw at the top. With that completed, let's try to boot. This first boot failed completely, and it kept giving the following post message. I can't really tell these beeps, but they sound like three long high-pitched beeps, followed by one low-pitched beep, all the same length. The fact that the post message runs continuously doesn't help either. I could find on the internet a short list of post messages for a compatible BIOS but I'm not sure that it fits this laptop. At least we could get a starting point. I found one that might fit the beeps I heard, but again, I couldn't really be sure. These were for general IBM BIOS, but many models ship with this, so we might find something. The error given by this code is keyboard or keyboard card error, so we might as well check that. At one point, I managed to pass post by spamming F1, while attempting to maybe get in the BIOS. Things would have been too simple if it were just for that. I got to a black screen showing the message, check cable connection, and no bootable disk, meaning it didn't detect the hard drive. The HDD sounds good, it gets power, and it doesn't make any unusual sounds. So let's try to get it to boot from a USB, to see if the rest of the computer works or if we have more unpleasant surprises that we have to tackle. After creating an Ubuntu install USB, I managed to boot after a couple of tries. Everything else seemed fine at the moment. I went in the disk section, and sure enough, it wouldn't detect the Toshiba hard drive. To make sure it's not the HDD, to rule that out, I grabbed my HP laptop and started disassembly. Here, it's pretty easy. We will take out the battery, and then proceed to remove all screws on the back. There is also one screw in the battery cutout, so we will take that one out too. I will also take out the optical drive. This laptop also has screws in the corners. We will remove the two rubber feet and then the adhesive holding them in. I will apply double-sided tape when putting it back together. After these two screws are removed, we can remove the two protective plastic panels and the two remaining screws. With that done, I will turn the laptop around and open it with a microfiber cloth on the top of the screwdriver so we don't scuff the plastics. All that's left to do is to pry the keyboard out, taking care to the connectors so they're not ripped or sliced in the process. With this done, I can disconnect the SSD from the laptop and then take the rubber mounts off. They're not held in by anything. Next, we have to move the bracket from the hard drive over to the SSD. All drives have screw holes in the corner, and as you can see, that's what hold the bracket to the HDD. Just unscrew these two, 
and then move the bracket over to the new drive. This SSD is from my daily laptop that I use when I'm not home. It has both Linux and Windows 10 on it. I will not put the HP back together in the video. If we fix this, I will use the SSD in this Toshiba and then buy a new one for my laptop. So let's just put this in the Toshiba and attempt to boot. Same exact thing, no bootable media found. Let's see if it does detect something in Linux, but I suspect something about the SATA port or controller, and I doubt it will actually see something. Now once booted in Zorin, we can head to the disk section and open it. As you can see, it doesn't really detect anything about the SSD. No capacity, nothing. Let's start taking this apart and see what we have. Just like with the HP, with the battery removed, we will start taking all the back screws out. There are plenty of these, and I'm going to put them aside in the exact same order. I had an experience with the other Toshiba, where they were different lengths, so I don't want to risk anything, and each screw is going to go back in the exact same hole it came out of. We will also remove the panels on the rear, and the optical drive, and the hidden screws behind the CD-DVD drive. Now, with the computer in the open position, we will pop the plastic trim out with a flathead screwdriver and then the screws holding the keyboard in. Next, the keyboard should slide right out. With the keyboard out, more screws are revealed. The nice thing about Toshiba laptops is that all screw holes are labeled, which makes it very easy to track and put it back together. After this, the front panel should pop right out. If under light to medium force it doesn't pop out, don't force it. That means that you missed the screw and try to track where it has the most resistance. Then look on the other side of that resistance point for a screw or more and remove them too. I will now remove all the connectors and the remaining screws holding the motherboard in and I will remove that. I will take a close look at the SATA port and inspect it. After a bit of trial and error off camera, I managed to make it a boot. With the board suspended with the help of this rubberized USB drive, it seems to detect its own HDD and boot without problems, as long as I spam F1 or F2. When I put it back together, it didn't want to boot again, but after disassembling it again and putting it like this, it works. The SSD still doesn't want to boot, but I suspect that the SSD has the OSs installed in UEFI. This laptop might be a bit too old for UEFI. Now, even if the SATA port looks good, I think there's a problem with it. If it were for the controller or the traces on the motherboard, it wouldn't have booted even now. Maybe the solder on the pins is cracked, because the port looks good. That could happen with time because of vibration, shock, and heat cycles. If, for instance, it's winter and you come in a warm house and immediately turn it on, and it heats up, because of the HDD and surrounding components, the repeated fast thermal expansion and contraction might cause cracking over time. What we could try tomorrow is a reflow solder to the port pins. If under no circumstances we can get it to work properly, I'll just end up replacing the optical drive with one of those hard drive caddies and put it in there. The next day I started off in the morning. It was Saturday, so finally we also have some natural light to help. Reflow soldering is really good, because you don't have to actually take the component off. It helps especially in the case of cracked solder. All you have to do to reflow solder is to heat up the old solder, add a bit of new one, and then let it cool off. So, I will proceed with this, and then when it's done, we could start pre-assembly. I'm not going to film the whole process, because it's hard to film and work properly with the camera in the way. While it's taken apart and the board is out, we might as well replace the old thermal paste. This loses its properties over time, and thus the thermal transfer is not as efficient. I have some compound lying around, but it's definitely newer than this 8-year-old paste. This laptop has a second-generation i5 and a GeForce 525M with 4GB of DDR3 RAM. We will remove the screws holding the heatsink in and then take it off. After that is completed, I will take some paper towels and rubbing alcohol and clean off the old compound. I will also remove the thermal pads on the VRMs and clean everything off. Coffee filters would have been better, because these paper wipes might leave some little debris on there.
but I will take extra care to wipe everything off so everything is as clean as possible. If you're doing this for the first time, you might want to know that it's very important to not touch the surface, because it has to be completely degreased. After this, I will apply the thermal paste on all the components, a P-side spot so that when it spreads it covers the whole die, including the VRMs that sit under this heatsink. I don't have to worry if it's slightly too much, since this paste is non-conductive. I will apply the heatsink on the components, evenly spreading the force on all points. This is very important as you don't want to shift the thermal paste on the die. Then I will add the screws in the order listed on the heatsink. All heatsinks have near the screw holes numbers to indicate in what order to put them in. I will slightly tighten them up, not all the way. Then on a second or third pass, I will tighten them slightly more until it's snug again in the same order as listed on the heatsink. I will clean everything here from dust and put the case back on, but without the screws, and let's start testing it. After spamming the F1 key, it did actually boot with it like this, so I think we might have fixed that boot problem. But the question is, why doesn't it pass post unless I press that key? I removed the keyboard, reminded of that post message we found on the internet and it booted without any problem. Also, when booted in Windows with a keyboard plugged in, it was typing random characters, and also some keys didn't work at all, or some typed in multiple different characters when pressing one key. Before ordering a new keyboard for this, let's attempt a few things. Sometimes, dropping the keyboard face down from 10 centimeters height might fix it. Also, with a pencil eraser, we can clean off the contacts on the flex cable with medium to light pressure. Also, pressing a couple of times each key might help. With this completed, let's try to put it back in the laptop and see what's going to happen. Same error. So I will use a USB keyboard for now, as we proceed and order a new keyboard. I put the SSD in the Toshiba, replacing the HDD, and it seems that it's recognized in the BIOS, but the OS's on it aren't. Also, in the BIOS it doesn't say anything about UEFI and Legacy Boot, so I suspect that we just have to format the SSD and it will work. With Windows 10 installed, now it seems to work fine. So, everything that was a problem was fixed. Or so I knew. I installed all the drivers in compatibility mode from Windows 7 as Windows 10 drivers are not available for this computer and waited for a new keyboard. I started to use this laptop to make sure everything is working and to my surprise there was another problem. The speakers would stop after a couple of seconds and not work at all, unless I stop all audio and then try again, when it works again for a couple of seconds to stop again. At first I suspected a driver problem but with a new keyboard arrived and ready to put it in, I also took my multimeter, disconnected the internal speaker, and found out that there is a short at the speaker port on the motherboard. All pins have continuity with others, including the left and right channels between them, and also with ground. That shouldn't have happened with the speakers plugged out. With 3.5mm jack headphones, it works perfectly. I'm not going to proceed to try the short on the traces, as that is very time consuming, and I will just proceed to use it with external speakers. This is it for today's video. Thank you guys for watching. If you did enjoy this video, please drop a like, and if you want to see more videos like this one, hit the subscribe button. See you next time on How Do I Tea.